What we're going to talk about tonight are the issues related to the size of cells, and that's all about the surface area to volume ratio. In addition to that, we're going to talk about cellular compartmentalization, how eukaryotic cells are organized, and we'll talk about eukaryotic cell parts and their functions. In addition, tonight, we're going to have a song of the week. There's going to be a weekly quiz. As always, there's going to be time for your questions. And that's what we've got going on tonight. We've got some B-I-O-L-O-G-Y. My name is Glenn Wokenfeld. I'm also known as Mr. W. My mission is to help you succeed in AP, IB, or college biology. One way that I'm really going to help you succeed is through a website that I created. It's called learn-biology.com. I also have an app that's called Biomania. I'm going to tell you more about both of those later on in the show. Cells, a basic introduction. Let's talk about the structure and fundamental parts of cells. So cells are the basic units of life. They're the basic units of structure and function in living things. And this is a very diagrammatic representation of how they're made up. So all cells have a membrane on the outside. The membrane distinguishes the inside of the cell from the outside. And the inside couldn't be more different from the outside because cells are super organized entities. And the membrane separates that super high level of organization from the relatively high level of entropy, disorganization outside the cell. All cells have some genetic information and that's in the form of DNA. And there are systems that cells have for maintenance and replication. And one of the most important of those systems is a system by which messenger RNA brings information to ribosomes and makes proteins. That's the central dogma of molecular biology. It's super important. And those proteins, most importantly, are enzymes that control the cell's metabolisms, that enable the cells to take in what it needs from the outside, to process it, to reproduce, to repair itself, and then ultimately to release waste that exit the cell, releasing entropy into the outer world. A big concept is the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We'll start with prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells have been around since the dawn of life, and that takes us back about 3.8 billion years ago. Prokaryotic cells are small, relatively simple, though they're extraordinarily complex. They have no nucleus, that's kind of what prokaryote means. Their chromosome is circularized. In other words, it's a DNA where the end and the beginning join up to create one continuous loop. They contain extra chromosomal pieces of DNA called plasmids, and they're found in two of life's three domains, the archaea and the bacteria. Eukaryotic cells, by contrast, are larger, much more complex. And this diagram is completely out of scale. The eukaryotic cell would dwarf the prokaryotic cell. Um, eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. They have multiple linear chromosomes. In other words, there's one end and another end. And if you were on the show a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Hayflick limit. That's part of the explanation for why we don't live forever. Their DNA is associated with proteins, and they have mitochondria. Mitochondria are really the thing that define eukaryotic cells. In other words, eukaryotic cells only exist because of mitochondria, though they, of course, are distinguished by their nucleus and other features. And eukaryotic cells have many organelles, specialized parts that are surrounded by a membrane. Here's an expert tip for you just to preview some stuff that we'll be talking about later on in the year. Prokaryote <clears throat> is actually a bad evolutionary category. The prokaryotes aren't a unified group. Prokaryotes don't derive from a common ancestor in the way that, say, all the vertebrates do or all the mammals. Those are all good, solid evolutionary groupings. But the basic idea is that Bacteria are one kind of prokaryote, and on a molecular level, they're quite different from the other prokaryotic group, archaea. That molecular level has involves looking at things like the sequence of RNA bases that make up ribosomes and things like that. It's fairly, um, it's fairly deep biology, but bacteria are no more, more closely related up for to learn archaea than they are to the eukaryote. Bio website that eukaryote, the third your name, success. actually came about. Please watch through, this. And this next is unbelievable. Video. A fusion 
of these two different domains, bacteria and archaea. We'll talk about that later. Let's move on to the issue of cell size. We started this show talking about why there aren't gigantic cells, like for example, an oceanic amoeba that's capable of swallowing up a scuba diver. Well, cells are small, and the reason why si why cells are small, and I put a range of size there, it's from about 0.1 micrometer to about 100 micrometers. And 100 micrometers, just so that you can have some sense of this, if you can imagine a millimeter, 100 micrometers is one-tenth of a millimeter. So that's pretty small. I mean, a millimeter, clearly visible. One-tenth of a millimeter, just visible. And it all comes down to diffusion. And the basic idea is that cells need to have enough membrane surface area to allow for diffusion of substances in and out. And that issue of, of having sufficient membrane surface area, that's all about cell size. Let's look at how this works. If you measure the relationship between surface area and volume in a cell, then what you find, not only for cells, but for any object, is that as an object gets larger, its amount of surface area relative to its volume. Okay, we're talking about a relationship between surface area and volume. So the amount of surface area relative to the volume decreases. And let's look at a little map. We have two cells here. One is one micrometer and the other is 10 micrometers. So let's look at surface area and volume in these two cells. These cells are cubic, just to make the math really easy. So for a cube that is one, unit of anything in, in, in size, then the surface area is six times the side squared. So one times one times six. So there'd be six units of surface area. The volume is one times one times one, one cubed. So the ratio of surface area to volume is six to one, six units of surface for every one unit of volume. Now, if we take a cell that's 10 times bigger, 10 micrometers on a side, but really it could be anything, then what we have is 10 times 10 times 6, 600. Wow, you might be thinking, that's a lot more surface area. But it's not really a lot more surface area because look at the volume. The volume's up to 1,000, 10 times 10 times 10. And so the surface area to volume ratio is 0.621. The larger cell surface area to volume ratio is one tenth of that of the smaller cell. Now, a consequence of that is that large cells can't efficiently use diffusion to get the nutrients they need in and to get wastes out. Large cells really can't effectively use diffusion for exchange of material. If you're in a typical AP bio class, there's a lab that you'll do where you'll make cubes that are made of agar. Agar is a seaweed extract. It's the thing that you grow bacteria on in a Petri dish. And these are cubes that have an acid base indicator on them. And what you do is your teacher will make up the cubes for you. Then you get the cubes, you cut them into various sizes, and then you soak them in vinegar. And in this acid base indicator, what will happen is that if they're basic, they'll be this beautiful magenta color. And if they're acidic, which is what vinegar is, then they'll turn white. So here we've got one, two, three, four cubes. And if I'm remembering their size, it's something like three centimeters on a side, two centimeters on a side, one centimeter on a side, and then 0.5. You let them sit in the vinegar for the same amount of time. The vinegar is diffusing into the cell. After X number of minutes, let's say it's five minutes, the smallest cube has all of its volume completely reached by the vinegar. It's completely reached by diffusion. Whereas the largest cube only has 19% of its volume reached by diffusion. If this were a cell, then well, this outer portion would be getting enough oxygen. It would be able to get rid of waste, but all of this inner material would be choking on waste and would be starving. That's why cells are small. Cells are small in order to give them enough surface area to volume so that they can exchange things by diffusion. That's why huge cells are impossible. Their insides would starve, they would choke on their wastes.
So how did life became, become large? Life became large not by having bigger cells, but by multicellularity and a host of adaptations that increased internal surface area to allow for the diffusion of materials in and out. Here we have two multicellular organisms. This is a beautiful kind of algae. It's called a volvox. And this is a kind of worm. It's called C. elegans. And it's interesting for a couple of reasons. It's only um, like one millimeter long, but it's incredibly studied in terms of developmental biology. And this whole organism is only about 900 cells. And biologists have been able to map out the cellular development of this organism is quite extraordinary. So let's look at some adaptations for increasing surface area. One is, let's just be flat. This is an, air, uh, an organism that's called a planarian. It's extraordinarily flat. Flat things have a lot of surface area relative to their volume. Think of a piece of paper. It's all surface. There's very little volume. So planarians don't have a circulatory system. They don't have a heart. They don't have blood. They have a digestive system, but the food just diffuses to their cells. They don't have a circulatory system. They don't really have a respiratory system. It's all about diffusion. Why do elephants have huge ears? Those ears are radiators. What they do is they provide a lot of surface area, allowing for the diffusion of heat. Why? Because an elephant's a big animal, and it can't easily, through its body surface, exchange heat with its environment. So it has evolved these huge ears. These are some dissected out gills. Thin flaps of tissue have lots of surface area. That's how fish absorb oxygen that they can bring to their blood. These, this is the inner lining of the mitochondrial membrane. It's not a lining, it's the inner mitochondrial membrane. And what is it for? It's because there are all these embedded enzymes that create ATP to have enough room for enough of those enzymes so the mitochondria can create lots of ATP. That inner membrane is highly folded. This is the inner surface of your intestine, highly folded, folds within folds, so that it can absorb food into your bloodstream, which will then circulate it to your body. So, Increased surface area for diffusion of molecules of heat, increased working surface for membrane embedded enzymes, and it's through thin sheets of tissue or highly folded surfaces. In terms of surface area, there are no small, like mouse-sized marine mammals. Think about all the mammals that live in the water. The smallest one is the otter. And some of the biggest, in fact, the biggest animals that have ever lived are marine mammals, whales, like the blue well, why are marine mammals big? Why are they never small? They're never small because mammals are warm-blooded and you lose heat through the outer surface of your body. The smaller you are when you're like a mouse, then you have a lot of surface area relative to your body. So the heat just diffuses out of the body. That's disastrous because you would become hypothermic very quick in cold water. And it doesn't have to be really cold water. It can be water that's that feels warm, like 70 degrees. But over time, your body temperature will wind up um, equilibrating, or, or you'll just wind up using up all your internal energy trying to maintain heat. So increased size decreases your surface area to volume ratio. Whales are able to withstand the cold of the ocean just because they're big. They have relatively little surface area relative to their volume. And again, it's a relative thing. Of course, a whale has a huge amount of surface area, but relative to its even huger volume, it doesn't have much. Biology, so cool. This concept, surface area to volume, it's one of the most powerful concepts in biology. We're gonna move on to the next part of this three-part lesson before we get to some of our special goodies at the end, our song of the week and our quiz. We're going to talk about cellular compartmentalization and the endomembrane system, which is really about how eukaryotic cells organi are organized and how that organization evolved. So first of all, let's talk about what this is, compartmentalization. Take the word apart and it'll tell you what it means. Compartmentalization is inner internal division into sections. When you go into a plane, there's a luggage compartment. When you go into a bus, there's a luggage compartment underneath the seats. So those are compartments. 
The advantages of compartmentalization is that it allows cells to have regions with internal chemistry that's distinct from the cytoplasm. So for example, this organelle over here at number seven, that's a lysosome. And what the lysosome does is it's filled with hydrolytic enzyme. It's kind of like an internal digestive organ, I'm trying to get that laser pointer, fantastic. And you don't want those hydrolytic enzymes released into the cytoplasm because they would break down the cytoplasm. So how does a cell handle that? Through compartmentalization. Another thing that compartmentalization does is it increases surface area for membrane-bound enzymes. So like, for example, the smooth ER has a lot of enzymes. Those enzymes can only work in the context of being embedded in a membrane. Well, let's build lots of membrane that produces lots of surface area. Let's talk about compartmentalization in prokaryotic, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, there's hardly any compartmentalization. There's minimal compartmentalization, though there's some. So like, for example, when we study about photosynthesis, we'll see that there are these sacs that are called thylakoids, and those are compartments that enable the light reactions of photosynthesis to happen. I'm showing them in a chloroplast, but they're also in free-living cyanobacteria. Those are photosynthetic bacteria. And there's also eukaryotic cells, which are highly compartmentalized. Many internal membranes that divide the cell into regions with distinct structures, chemistry, and function. And examples of those compartments are lysosomes, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, and vacuoles. Many eukaryotic compartments are part of what's called the endomembrane system. And that's a dynamic system of internal membranes and compartments. So here we have the nuclear membrane, which is contiguous with the rough ER, which is contiguous with the smooth ER. The smooth ER buds off vesicles, which go to the Golgi. The Golgi buds off vesicles that go to lysosomes and go to the membrane. Phospholipids are moving between these various parts. So I'm showing a static picture, but you have to imagine a lot of dynamism of parts moving from one part to another. Membrane and materials flow from one compartment to the next. How did compartmentalization come about? We're explaining the origin of mitochondria, cellular compartmentalization, and chloroplasts. It's really the origin of the eukaryotes, which means, hey, this is what's so cool about biology. It's about the origin of you and me, because we're eukaryotes. This is how our kind of cell came into the universe 1.8 billion years ago. So the basic idea is that this arose as a kind of mutualistic endosymbiosis. Mutualism is when two beings help one another out in a way so that both benefit. If you are studying biology and you have a study partner and you both help each other, that's a mutualistic relationship. If you harm someone else as you take from them, that's a parasitic relationship. So mutualism, it's a win-win. Endosymbiosis is, symbiosis is living together. Endosymbiosis is when one thing lives inside another. So back to parasitism. If you get infected by a parasite, it can be a bacterial parasite or a worm or something like that, that's endosymbiosis, but it's negative endosymbi endosymbiosis. This is positive, mutualistic endosymbiosis. So what happened? In the scenario that I think makes the most sense, there's an archaeal cell that took up a bacterial cell. The two cells were living in close association, probably already exchanging materials, but at one point the bacterial cell phenomenally went inside the archaeal cell, and the archaeal cell did not digest that cell. It either allowed the cell to continue to live inside of it, the bacterial cell, or the bacterial cell had some mechanism that kept itself from being digested. But in any case, over time, that bacterial cell evolved into a mitochondrion. And secretion of vesicles from that bacterial cell that was to become a mitochondrion led to the nuclear membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum. Later, a second endosymbiotic event 
led to chloroplasts being taken up by an early eukaryotic cell. And that led to the uh, origins of the algae and the plants. So endosymbiosis is how the eukaryotes came together. This is a story that was popularized by a scientist named Lynn Margulis, who I totally encourage you to learn more about, a really important groundbreaking scientist. So just to take another look at the three domains, what I want to point out is that bacteria were taken up by archaea, and that led to the eukaryotes. Our domain, all of us eukaryotes, the plants, the fungi, the animals, they're all a combination of these two other domains. And then later, cyanobacteria, that's a free living bacterial photosynthetic organism was taken up by an early eukaryote and that led to the plants and the algae. It's quite an extraordinary story. When you think about it, that means that you are kind of a big colony of bacteria because that's what mitochondria are. It's pretty phenomenal. Um, what's the evidence for this astounding idea? Like bacteria, both mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA. Why would they have their own DNA? Because they were once independent cells. They replicate themselves through binary vision. We don't replicate our mitochondria. They replicate themselves. They have their own ribosomes and they produce some of their own proteins. And those ribosomes are like bacterial ribosomes in terms of their RNA sequence and their structure. Also, both mitochondria and chloroplasts have two membranes, and that is a vestige of the fact that they were once engulfed by another cell that surrounded them with a membrane. Eukaryotic cell parts and their functions. So let's talk about the nucleus. The nucleus's function is it stores and protects genetic information genetic information, the DNA that we inherited from our parents. The DNA is wrapped around proteins. Those proteins are called histones. You'll learn all about that in unit six, and they form structures that are called chromosomes. Here's a chromosome over here. But most of the time during the cell's life, the DNA is spread out in a diffuse form that's called chromatin. There's a dark spot in the middle of a nucleus. You can see it when you look at the cell's with a microscope, which is something that I hope you do in your biology lab, you see a dark spot, it's called the nucleolus here, it's over here. And what it is, is a ribosome factory. It assembles ribosomes. The nuclear membrane separates chromosomes from the cytoplasm and nuclear pores are found throughout the nuclear membrane and they allow molecules to enter and leave. So for example, we were talking before about how messenger RNA is sent from the DNA to ribosomes. That messenger RNA leaves the nucleus through a nuclear pore. But there's other molecules that come in that act as what are called transcription factors that tell the nucleus what mRNA it should be producing. So there's communication that goes back and forth. What about ribosomes? Those are particles that are composed of RNA and protein. That RNA, because of where it is, is called ribosomal RNA. And they consist of a large subunit and a small subunit. The ribosome's function, it reads a genetic message that's encoded in a sequence of mRNA. So here, the ribosome is reading mRNA and it translates that message into a sequence of amino acids that make up the primary structure of a protein. In a previous episode of the AP Biology Show, I discussed how there are four levels to proteins. You can go back and watch that episode again if you need to. The details of translation and protein synthesis are mind-blowingly cool, and we will talk about that when we get to unit six much later in the year. Where in a eukaryotic cell can ribosomes be found? I tripped over this earlier in the show, but ribosomes can be free or bound. Free ribosomes, like those shown at three, are floating freely in the cytoplasm, whereas bound ribosomes at four are connected to the membrane of the rough ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. 
The key idea, and again, this is another thing that um, you can learn about on learn-biology.com, is all ribosomes start out as free. And through a process called protein targeting or signal translocation, they migrate to the ER to become bound. There's a tutorial about that on learn-biology.com. What about the structure and function of the mitochondria? Well, the function is converting food energy into ATP. ATP, as we discussed a little bit earlier in the course, but this is really a topic that we'll hit on in unit three. This is the molecule that enables your cells to get work done. Every time you contract a muscle, every time you think a thought, um, well, for a muscle, it's direct. For the thought, it's a little bit indirect. But all of those things wouldn't be possible without ATP, which enables cells to do work. The key structures in the mitochondria going from the inside out, there's a matrix, which is essentially the cytoplasm of the mitochondria. Why does it have cytoplasm? Because it was once an independent cell. Those consist of enzymes for the Krebs cycle, a very important reaction that we'll learn about in unit three. There is a chromosome. Mitochondria have their own DNA that's shown at number three. They also have ribosomes, which aren't shown in this diagram. Those are both evidence of the fact that mitochondria were once free living bacterial cells. The inner membrane, which is shown at two over here, it's highly folded. And that's an adaptation for increasing surface area, which enables the mitochondrion to produce more ATP because it takes a lot of embedded enzymes, protein uh, pumps, things like that to produce ATP. And that is what I just said. There's an intermembrane space, which is also important in the process. It enables the mitochondrion to trap protons and the diffusion of protons is later used to synthesize ATP. The outer membrane at one is a vestige of endosymbiosis, and that's what mitochondria are all about. The endoplasmic reticulum, it's an interconnected series of channels between the nuclear membrane and the Golgi body, and it's got two forms, rough and smooth. The rough ER, it's studded with ribosomes. So all these little dots over here, those are all ribosomes, and it synthesizes proteins that can get included in lysosomes, other organelles, into the membrane itself or for export by the cell. And what I have over here is a picture that's really extraordinary. Every time that you fight off an infection, you have immune system cells that are called B cells. When those B cells get stimulated to fight off an infection, what happens is they build up a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum. Why? Because they're producing tons of proteins that get secreted into the blood that fight off whatever pathogen has invaded you. What about the smooth ER? It's on the outer side of the ER network. So here's the rough ER, here's the smooth ER. It lacks ribosomes, but it still has many embedded enzymes and the functions vary by tissue. So it can be synthesis of lipids, it can be converting toxins into soluble forms that can be excreted from the body, and it can be carbohydrate breakdown and synthesis. And I'm seeing a question from Ram that is just filling me with joy. So I really want to encourage you guys to ask questions. Does the Golgi body or the rough ER give newly made proteins their tertiary or quaternary structure? I would think about it this way. The rough ER has these ribosomes that are producing proteins. Those proteins that are initially emerging are probably in a tertiary form, and then they would probably be combined later. So that can happen in the cytoplasm, or it might happen in the Golgi. The Golgi has enzymes that are trimming off pieces of proteins or adding little pieces. The Golgi is frequently... Um, uh, thought of as being like a packaging and sorting center. So the Golgi will package proteins in vesicles. Those vesicles will have little molecular tags, and those tags will tell the proteins where to go. Are they destined for export? Are they destined for the membrane? And so on and so forth. So I don't think it's really clear about whether they would leave one area and tertiary structure and then become quaternary somewhere else. But basically, as protein synthesis 
ends at the ribosome, the tertiary structure is already emerging. So that would be happening in the rough ER. It would also be happening in the cytoplasm. And it could be in the Golgi that these polypeptide chains are put together. But I need to learn more about that, Ram. So I'm very grateful to you for asking that question. And I'm not a thousand, or I guess you can't really be more than a hundred percent sure, but thank you very much for that question. It's really the best I can do on that one. And the Golgi complex, what we were just talking about, it's a series of flattened membrane bound sacs. It receives vesicles from the rough and smooth ER and chemically modifies the contents. And those are usually proteins. And it packages modified proteins into vesicles that are sent to organelles to the cell membrane or exported from the cell. It's also known as the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus. Your success at AP Biology starts here. Are you struggling with AP Bio? With Learn-Biology.com, students get the skills and confidence to be a top student and earn fours and fives on the AP Bio exam guaranteed. Go to Learn-Biology.com to find out how you can master your biology course and crush the AP Bio exam. What about the structure and function of lysosomes? First of all, you're never going to have to identify a lysosome on the AP bio exam. That is because lysosomes are simply vesicles that are filled with enzymes. So they're clearly identified over here, but you can't really identify them and don't worry about them, but do know their function. And their function is to contain hydrolytic enzymes they're found only in animal cells. It's another important thing to know. And they carry out intracellular digestion. So I wasn't able to get this photo to show to you, but there is a photo of like a mitochondrion that's being engulfed by a vesicle and then fused with a lysosome. And that's how a mitochondrion, when it's worn out, will end up getting digested by the cell. And that's what I just said. They recycle worn out organelles, damaged um, organelles, and they play a key role in what's called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. I'm getting a question about knowing about chromosomes, and do you have to know about them in depth? No, I would just know at this point in a unit two test that chromosomes are how DNA is packaged up. You'll learn later about the details of that packaging because that's important in relationship to gene expression, but that's mostly a topic that's in unit six. Now, I do want to say that every teacher is going to teach this material in a different way, but when I taught AP Bio, I was mostly getting my students to understand the basic structure and function of these various parts. Unit two is kind of like an overview and the details happen later. And uh, Priyanthan, thank you very much for that question. Great question. What about the cytoskeleton? It's a dynamic network of protein fibers. It enables cells to move materials and organelles and enables cells to move their membranes. So even though ame amoebas can't swallow up divers, they can swallow up other things like bacteria. So can your white blood cells. Your white blood cells roam your body looking for infecting cells and they'll also stretch their membrane around an invading cell and engulf it in this process that we'll learn about later in unit two that's called endocytosis. Centrosomes, centrioles. The centrosome is the organelle. It has two centrioles. And those centrioles, what they do is they create a spindle of fibers that separate chromosomes during mitosis and meiosis. And those are unit four and unit five topics. And Devika, thank you so much for asking me this question. I am trying to do a live show every Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. All right, so you can count on me here, but you know, if you can't make the live show, you can always watch it on replay. What about the central vacuole? It's only found in plant cells. Its functions are water storage, storing and releasing needed molecules, and sequestering waste products. Evolutionary origin of chloroplasts, they were once free living cells, just like mitochondria, and they took up 
residents within an early eukaryotic cell. Their function is creating carbohydrates through photosynthesis. The details of how chloroplasts work and the details of photosynthesis, which is like the coolest process imaginable, that will happen in unit three. Plant cell walls, chemical composition, they're made of cellulose, that's a polysaccharide. We talked about that in unit one. Their major function is they act as a pressure vessel that prevents overexpansion in response to inward water flow. It's called osmotic pressure. And paper, wood, cotton, those are all things that are made of cellulose. It's one of the most important substances in our civilization. And now it's time for our song of the week. Get out of the rain And there was the gatekeeper The cell membrane I went into a cell And what did I see? The mitochondria It's the energy factory I went into a cell And said who drives this bus And found myself Talking to the boss The nucleus I went into a cell To recover from a spasm And Found myself swimming in some clear cytoplasm. I went into the nucleus to ask how to get home and got genetic info stored in a chromosome. I went into a cell and stretching oh so far was a thin and wavy network. It's called the ER. I went into a cell trying not to be perplexed by the packaging and sorting in the Golgi complex. I went into a cell and said, who makes proteins here? And somebody responded, it's the ribosome, my dear. I went into a cell and was feeling pretty fine till a lysosome engulfed me and dissolved me in enzymes. I went into a cell and was feeling pretty nimble till a century old ass sewed me tying me up in a spindle. I went into a plant cell to see how trees get so tall and all around the outside was a rigid cell wall. I went into a plant cell, why is it so green I asked? Cause I make food from sunlight, said a green chloroplast. I went into a plant cell to see how plant cells store food when a vacuole informed me that he was the storage dude. So when you go inside a cell, remember what you see. There's over a trillion cells in both you and me. Just sing this song if you ever feel confusion. And remember, active transport is the opposite of diffusion. So right now I've gone out to learn-biology.com. That's my AP Bio learning website. And now it's time for our weekly quiz. So what works best in this format is multiple choice quiz. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions and what you're gonna do is you are gonna type in the letter of the answer. So I just chose multiple choice quiz one and gotta log in. Okay, so we talked about cell parts and we talked about cell size and that's really, and we did talk about compartmentalization and the origins of cell compartmentalization. So that's a lot of questions. We're not gonna do that many. And Ram is asking me a very general question about FRQs. What are some common mistakes that you see your students make that make it hard to give them a point credit for the uh, question? So the, the mantra of FRQs is claim, evidence and reasoning. So I, I think what I find is that when students don't give evidence to back up an assertion, that's often where they lose points on an FRQ. And of course, there's the most basic thing, which is like, you don't read the question. But one thing that I wanna emphasize, I'm just gonna show you this, is that I've got all of these practice FRQs 
on learn-biology.com. They're very short because, you know, I'm giving them online and they're not really um, like the College Board of RQs in terms of their life, but they will really help you in terms of getting good practice at developing specific FRQ answers. But let's do a couple of multiple choice questions, okay? So everybody ready? The diagram below illustrates a process related to glucose homeostasis in liver cells. And for those of you in the listening audience, we've got a membrane, there's an insulin receptor, there's um, a glucose transporter molecule, and then there's a bunch of molecules that are part of a cascade and there's a vesicle that's budding off from something within the cell. The structure that the GLUT4 vesicle, that's a vesicle that has a bunch of glucose transporters, buds off from is most likely what? And here are your choices. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, that's one. The Golgi complex, that's two. The rough endoplasmic reticulum, that's three. And four is a lysosome. You folks who have been watching know enough to answer this question. And I've seen one answer come in from Priyanthan. Who else is going to try and answer this question? Okay, let's go with, uh, I hope it's okay, okay to call you Priya. Answer, chose, oh, we got a four. Let's go, go with Priya's answer. The Golgi complex, yes. A typical pathway for the creation of membrane-embedded protein like the GLUT4 protein is shown below. The vesicle that brings a protein like GLUT4 to the membrane would be represented by six. The vesicle would butt off from the Golgi, which is shown at five. So that's the kind of questions and feedback that you get at learn-biology.com. Let's do another question. Which letter in the diagram represents the rough endoplasmic reticulum? We've got a cell that's shown with its membrane. We've got a structure that has a dark spot in the middle outside of it. There's a series of channels with dots, and then there's a series of flattened sacs, and then there's um, a membrane. So we've got A, B, C, or D. What are, what, what do we have here? We have A, B, C, or D? And I see one answer that's come in from Ram. Any other answers? What represents the endoplasmic reticulum? And let's go with A. Nice job. A represents the rough ER. You folks are doing fantastic. Next question. KDEL is a short polypeptide sequence consisting of four amino acids. Lysine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and leucine. As certain proteins are being synthesized and or modified, KDEL binds with a specific receptor. This receptor, in turn, prevents the protein from being secreted in a vesicle for further modification. Based on this description, the KDEL EL receptor is most likely found in the plasma membrane, the cytoplasmin. Cytopl cytosol, the endoplasmic reticulum, or the mitochondria. So what do we have here? Um, what do you think? Let's call this A or 1, B. Let's go A, B, C, or D. Where's KDEL? All right. Seems like A is the majority. I'm going to click on A. No. Take a look at the diagram below. The only way that a protein is going to get to the membrane would be through a vesicle, such as the one at six or four below. Using the diagram, see if you can find a location where proteins are synthesized or modified before they would be incorporated into a vesicle. That's where you might find the KDEL receptor. So what I want you to notice is what we do on learn-biology.com. If you get it wrong, you get a hint. And then you get to try that question again. These questions are like a stack of cards. In a marine food chain that ends with a humpback whale, phytoplankton are the first link. Phytoplankton, that means plants that are tiny cells that float around in the water. Which of the following statements apply to both the mitochondria of humpback whales and the chloroplasts of phytoplankton? One, contains its own DNA. Two, makes ATP by chemiosmosis. Three, temporarily stores energy and reduced electron acceptors. Guys, this is a tough 
question. Tough question. This one, this is really like an end of the year kind of question. So anybody want to give it a try? Okay. So the truth is, is that the answer is, I believe, three. One, two, and three. All of those statements are correct. Yes. They have their own DNA. They make ATP by a process called chemiosmosis. You'll learn about that later. They store energy in reduced electron carriers. I just want to tell you about your plan for this week. If you're in AP Bio, then what I want you to do is go ahead and do some of these tutorials on learn-biology.com because what you'll do is you'll get to read, you'll get to practice, you'll get to reinforce these ideas. It's really going to help you learn this material. You will make huge gains in your learning. And I hope to see you also on learn-biology.com. Please subscribe and also watch the next video.